Good morning, everyone. Well, my name is Chris Quinn. I'm the youth pastor here at Portland Community Church. And uh, we've been going through a series called Things I Wish Jesus Never Said. So it's a series of different things that he has said that uh, make us a little bit uncomfortable, things that we don't necessarily like, but they are things that he said and the way that he wants us to live. And so uh, we are concluding that uh, series this morning, and it's actually at the very end of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And if you do a straight read-through of the Sermon on the Mount, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes, but it is jam-packed full of some of Jesus' Jesus's most famous and most important teachings for us. And so this morning, we're going to look at what it means to have a solid foundation. And so uh, when I was thinking about that, I remembered that there was this building in the city of Dubai. And I visited Dubai on my way through to India uh, several years ago. And it's this building called the Burj Khalifa. And yes, I looked it up on YouTube how to pronounce that. So I got it right. Okay. And uh, it is 2,700 feet tall. So that's a ha over a half mile. Okay, it's a half mile tall. It has 160 floors, twice the size of the Empire State Building in New York. Now, some of the cool fun facts about this place, it has the world's highest observation deck on the 124th floor. That sounds terrifying. Uh, and then it also has the world's highest swimming pool on the 76th floor. That sounds like fun. Let's go for a little swim on the 76th floor. Uh, and, but the secret of this building is its foundation on what it was built upon. You see, they took a year to dig deep into the ground and then poured 58,900 cubic yards worth of concrete into that ground and weighing in at 110,000 tons. Now, there's a reason I went into ministry and not math. Um, there's a certain line where a number is so big that all it is for me, just, just it, I categorize it as a lot. So I have a hard time contextualizing, wait, what, what does that actually mean? 110,000 tons. What does that actually look like? Well, I did some research and the world's largest animal is the blue whale clocking in at 200 tons. Whew, that's a, that's a big animal. Okay. So if you do the math, they put in 550 blue whales worth of concrete into the ground to make sure that this building stood firm. Now that's incredible and that's insane that they did that. And so what this, this is the key for this massive building to stand and to withstand the elements. Dubai is actually a really windy city is that they had to dig really deep into the ground. And so the same is true for us. When we want to have a solid foundation, we want to stand firm in our faith in Jesus Christ, and we want to be the kind of people that God has called us to be, we need to build a solid foundation. We need to dig deep into the ground of who Jesus is. And so we're going to look at that, what that means today. And so this is not merely, uh, Jesus was not merely talking about a lesson in, in architecture and giving you some wise house house building tips. What he is doing here is he's giving us a standard and a way to live so that our lives would not crumble. And so this morning we're going to look at three different principles of that will help us build a firm foundation in Jesus Christ. And so we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 29. I invite you to turn there right now. If you do not have a Bible and you want to open up a hardcover Bible, there's one in the seat in front of you. That'll be on page 972. And I want to make sure we make clear what's happening here. Right now, we're, in, we're at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' magnum opus of his sermons, okay, of what he, his biggest sermon that he gives. And what we have here is we have him basically saying to them, you have thought this way, but this is the reality. So Jesus is flipping everything upside down. He's basically making what we call the upside down kingdom, that now you think this is how you live, this is how you live instead. And so Jesus is building this foundation. He's building this idea so that they understand that they cannot make themselves righteous by their own works, by their own activities. They cannot do it. And so that's what this whole sermon is all about. And so let's begin. I'm going to read uh, 24 through 25. 
Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. And so when you hear this phrase, look at what Jesus says, and this is, this is always a good Bible tip. When you, hear, when you see the word therefore, always ask the question, what's the therefore, therefore? And what Jesus is doing is he's just talked about how these people are going to come to him and they say to him, Lord, we, we did miracles in your name. We, perform, we prophesied in your name. Don't we know you? And Jesus say, I, I never knew you. I never knew you. And so what Jesus is pointing to here is he's saying, every, he's saying to, now he's going to talk about what it is, how people are going to know that they are real followers of Christ, how they really know that they have been saved. And so listen to what he says. Everyone who hears these words of mine and this is referring to the Sermon on the Mount he's just given, hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. See, it's more than just hearing what Jesus has to say or even believing it in your head. It's actually saying, I'm going to live this out. I'm going to put these things into practice so that I may live the way that Jesus lived. And so when we look at this, we need to refresh our memory on some of the things that Jesus said. Because remember, these are the things we wish Jesus never said. These are the uncomfortable things. So listen to this list and start to think about you living this out and making a practice and a habit of these kinds of things. First of all, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. If you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Don't pray that so, you, so that you will be seen by people. Forgive others as you have been forgiven. Store up treasures in heaven, not on earth. Do not worry, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Do not judge unless you are willing to be judged by the same standard. Treat others as you want to be treated. And so we need to be clear about something. Looking at this list, we should immediately think in our minds, this is absolutely impossible for us to do this on our own. I had a friend in high school who this was one of his biggest qualms to coming to faith in Christ, was he would look at this list and he would say, Jesus gave this list, that, and it's an impossible list. Is that even fair that he would give us this list of things that we need to be doing uh, and then call us out to live it? And then that's it. Like, th that seems unfair. The point of the sermon is that it is impossible, it is impossible for, live, for us to live in this way on our own effort and on our own strength. It begins, the sermon begins very purposefully, Jesus does, with the Beatitudes where it, be, it starts with saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That basically the main attitude of the life of Christ, of being a Christian, is to come before God and say, I'm poor in spirit. I've got nothing that I can offer you. I can't offer up my own righteousness on my own that would make me right before you, that I could know you, that I could spend eternity with you, that I could be the kind of person you have designed and created for me to be on this earth. I can't do that on my own effort. That's, that's the summary of what this Sermon on the Mount is all about. You can't do this on your own. You need a righteousness. Jesus even says this in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, that basically your righteousness needs to, your righteousness needs to surpass that of the Pharisees, who these guys were these religious leaders that created these rules, these impossible set of rules that went even further than the Jewish laws about how they were to live. He says, your righteousness needs to go beyond that. And it's a righteousness that it can only be given by God himself. And it's a radical transformation that happens. When you put your faith in Christ, it's supposed to be this radical thing that happens that now you become the righteousness of God. I love this verse. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. It's this amazing concept that when we put our faith in Christ, because he died on the cross and took on all of our sins on the cross on himself, that now when he died, he paid the penalty for all of that, all of what we've done for all, person, all peoples on this earth through all of eternity. Okay? Every single person, this is all, the, everything has been put on the cross on Jesus. And so as a result, now when we put our faith in Christ, we now are given the righteousness of God, that now we walk around and now that's what we are identified as. That is the righteousness that goes beyond the Pharisees and what they could do on their effort. So that's where we start with this whole idea about 
this total transformation and hearing these words of Jesus and putting them into practice is to say to God before him, I cannot do this. I need you to transform me so that I will live in this way. And that list that I read for you, and again, that, that was just a Reader's Digest version of some of the things that Jesus says. There's a lot more in there. And so really, when we put our faith in Christ, we're not just putting our faith in Christ for salvation and for going to heaven someday. Those are true realities. But we are putting our faith in Christ so that he would transform us and we would act in a way that would put these things into practice that he has taught. God gives us the, the ability and the enablement to do this through his grace. Grace isn't just a forgiving thing. It's also an enabling thing. That you will now be able to be the kind of people that God has called you to be to, so that you can live for Christ. And where it all starts, look at what he says, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Building our house on the rock is not merely, again, it's not merely this good advice on building a house. It's this statement of when you build your life upon Jesus himself, Jesus himself is the rock. But not only that, building your life upon what he taught if you do that, you are like the wise man who built his house on the rock. So this is actually our first principle for this morning, is that it is wise to not only hear what Jesus said, but to put it into practice and do it. It's really important for us to understand this. This is a wise life that Jesus is laying before us. And he's laying before us this, this kind of, this choice, this make or break choice, and in honor of Star Wars coming out soon, do or do not, there is no try. I'm a nerd. I'm sorry. <laughs> and when you look at this, this is like the thing is that there is no middle ground. You are either doing this or you are not. You need to be putting this into practice and doing it, actively acting this out. And again, the, the Holy Spirit and the righteousness that God has given you enables you to do it. But this is an evidence to the rest of the world that your faith is legitimate when you act in a way that reflects who Jesus is. And James even says, this is a common thread throughout the New Testament. The book of James even says this. That he says, let us not be merely hearers of the word, but doers of the word. So we don't just simply come to church, hear what, God, hear what God says through the word, and then forget about it when we go home. This is something that we now let our whole lives be built upon. And then we look at this next phrase where he says, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. He's talking about this storm. We're not talking about the typical northwest rain shower that we're getting even right now. But this is something that is about a storm that has just been barraged and been put onto you. And we look at this in, in the Bible, typically a storm coming is actually a sign of a judgment and a sign of testing coming at them. You think of the book of Jonah. It actually says that God hurled, like literally threw a storm towards Jonah. And when we look at that phrase, like that, this is God testing, like getting Jonah to realize, hey, I don't want you to go that way when you're trying to run away from me from what I've called you to do to go preach to Nineveh. I want you to come back this way. And so these storms that come, they're not merely just about trials and temptations and testings, though those are real and that's a huge part of it. But this is also about the fact of being able to stand before God on judgment day and have absolutely no fear because we have become the righteousness of God by putting our faith in Christ. And when we build our lives upon that idea, that idea alone, that this is our foundation, this is what I'm going to build my life upon. Everything else I do and everything else that I think, everything about my life then filters through that idea. And look at what happens when you build that kind of a foundation. It does not fall. There is nothing that can tear you down if you have put your faith fully in Christ and put your life into a place that you are saying, I am going to follow what he said as well. Nothing can tear that apart. You might get bruised. You might get beaten down a little bit. You might have a little bit of defeat here and there, but you are not ultimately, you will not ultimately lose the war because God has enabled you to do this, to build you up and to live in a way that would now produce the good deeds because God has transformed you. Okay, let's continue. Verse 26. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. 
So now Jesus contrasts the other side. And this is actually very classic, uh, what you would do like in the book of Proverbs. You compare two sides. You contrast these two sides of this coin. And one of them is wisdom and one of them is about foolishness. And so Jesus is now saying, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like the man who decided to build his house on sand. We all know this is common sense for us that we would know that it would be silly if we knew someone, we had a friend of ours who said, you know what, I really want to live at the beach. So I'm going to go down to Seaside, Oregon, and I'm going to build my house right, I want to be as close as possible to the beach as I can get, so I'm going to build my house right on the beach. We all know that's a terrible idea. Okay, erosion's going to happen, uh, you're going to have the sand, the sand shifts, it's just not, it's just not going to work. It's not going to go well. We all know this. We all know this is a foolish idea, a silly idea. His house is going to fall apart. And so Jesus is talking about this in one ear, out the other kind of mentality. That we would hear Jesus' words and then don't seek ways to make them apply to our lives or actively live them out in every single moment of our day. We have this really bad tendency as human beings to, especially in, in the church, to come to church on Sunday and then that's all we do. And then the rest of our lives have no difference, no change whatsoever. That's not the kind of life that God wants for us as his followers. He wants for us to daily be committing ourselves to him, daily getting to know him, daily pursuing him, and as well, daily pursuing others so that they might know Christ, to live in a way that the rest of the world would look at us and go, wait a minute, they're acting totally different than anybody else that I know. Why? Why is that? Why are they living that way? That's what we want to be able to do. And so again, we, this also could be this idea where someone could be looking at Jesus and saying, well, you know, I've got, I've, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a generally good person, you know, I, like, I've never murdered anyone, I've never raped anyone, I've never stolen anything, I've never done all these bad, you know, I've, I've I had these little missteps from he, here and there. And so, you know, God, God will someday just let me in because, you know, my good deeds outweigh my bad. When, I t when you build your foundation upon that idea, Jesus is very, very clear. When the storms come, when judgment day comes, or when the testing and trials and temptations that come your way, it's going to fall. And, I, and it's very relatable how Jesus puts this. It'll fall with a great crash. And so I'm telling you, if you have not put your faith in Christ, if you're in here this morning and you, are, and you have not put your faith in Christ before, let me just tell you, and I'm telling you this is going to happen, if you build your life on anything other than Jesus, just wait. It's going to crumble. But for those of us who are Christians, there's all kinds of weak foundations that we still might put our lives upon because we have forgotten or we get distracted. We, we, and so we focus on these things. There's things like money. There's things like our status. There's things like relationships and marriage and family and kids. We might look at our... Uh, we might look at our, uh, our sports teams and hope that, and put our hopes in them that, that someday they're going to bring us something that we're looking for. We might look at a politician and hope that they're going to change the world. We might look for, you know, inspirational quotes and teachings from people outside of the Bible and say, oh, that's going to, that's going to change how I think. That's going to change how I live. Jesus is extremely clear here. If you build your life on anything else other than him and his teaching, it is sinking sand and your house will fall like a, with, with a great crash. And so we need to think about the shifting sand. Even just think about how much things are even changing in our world right now. Just think back. Think back five years, how much has changed. Even just in that time, how much has changed in five years? How much has changed in the last 10, even the last 50 years? Can you imagine what's going to change now in 5, 10, 50 years from this point on? But you know who doesn't change? It's Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so putting our lives on anything else other than Jesus will absolutely fail. And I can speak to this from experience. I know this all too well. When I was in high school, I built my life upon this idea that I was going to be a basketball player. I was going to, and I, I think by this time I'd started to realize that probably the NBA was a, was not going to happen, <laughs> was a, was a pipe dream. Um, but at least I wanted to be on varsity. I wanted to contribute. I wanted to be good. And then by the end of my freshman year, as I continually made my way back on the bench 
to being one of the last guys that would play, that whole foundation crumbled and completely fell apart. And personally, I crashed. And then there was a time where I built my life upon this idea of this job that I had that I loved and I loved these people I got to work with and be a part of. And I thought, this is where it's going to be. This is what I'm going to have for the rest of my life. And it crashed when I lost it, when it was taken from me. And so that was something else. It totally crashed. And then as well, then I, was, you know, some, I, I started to decide, okay, you know what? I'm just going to do it on myself, on my own. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to live this life on my own. I'm going to be uh, who I need to be all on my own effort, all on my own work. I can take care of this. And I can tell you that also fell with a great crash as I realized I can't do this on my own effort, on my own strength. And so when we see this, these storms that might come, if we have built our lives on anything else than Christ, they will completely crumble. And so we might start to ask the question, okay, so then why is this important? Why, why does Jesus get the, have the right to say these kinds of things about my life and how I'm living? Why does Jesus get to say this? Let's look at verses 28 through 29. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So when Jesus finishes this long sermon that he's given, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. And it's not just because he was this really gifted and talented public speaker, but it was because of how he spoke, the authority in which he spoke. And sometimes people take this phrase of authority and then start to think, okay, this means that I can claim anything in Jesus' name. You know, I want a Mercedes, so I'll claim that in Jesus' name. I get to have that. That's not what he's talking about here. The authority of which he's talking about is the authority to take the teachings of the world and go, well, mine's up here. Mine's better. But this authority comes from something even greater than the fact that Jesus is a really smart guy or even that Jesus was a really great teacher, but the fact that he is God himself. This is a strong testimony of what the Bible says is that Jesus claimed to be God. And this is how he proved it. He proved it by not only dying on the cross, but then raising from the dead I think that's a pretty secure way to prove that you are God by saying, I'll rise again from the dead and then do it. And he did. He claimed to be God and he rose from the dead. And so that, then that proves. So now he's God. And so he has this authority. And so this is our third principle is that it is wise to adhere to Christ's teaching because he is God and speaks with his authority. He is God. And so now we have to look and when he says things like this, we go, okay, this isn't just one of my professors from college or one of my teachers that I have in school. This is, this is God himself talking. I need to build my life upon what he is saying and who he is. And we build it upon his love because of what he has done for us. It's this incredible idea. And so none of what Jesus says has any sort of authority or any sort of weight upon our life if he didn't basically claim that he was God and then raised from the dead, which is what he did. And it's this amazing concept of God, God's love just saying, I want you to live this life, but I'm going to pave the way. This looks impossible, but I'm going to pave the way so that this is possible for you to live this way because I love you and I'm going to give myself up for you. You see, God is preparing himself a people who are devoted to him fully, who give their lives to him fully and say, I'm going to obey and follow you with my life and I want it to be changed. I'm going to see how I look at everything. Everything's going to be viewed totally differently. I'm going to view how I treat my teachers and coaches differently. I'm going to treat, I'm going to treat my bosses and my neighbors. I'm going to treat them differently. I'm going to act in a way that is now going to reflect who Jesus is. I'm going to love those who hate me. I'm going to pray for those who persecute me. We're going to do those kinds of things instead of looking like the rest of the world. And so this is what it's all about is that a life devoted to him leads to being fortified, to being firm, to stand firm. So when testing and trials and temptations come our way, we are not going to fall. We're not going to submit to them. We're not going to give ourselves to them, but instead we're going to say, my foundation is on Jesus, who he is and what he has done, and I'm going to trust in him. I'm going to let him be the one that leads my life. So I'm a little bit, as a, even as a young guy in ministry, I, I'm still a little bit old school. I like hymns a lot. 
Because I think there's some old hymns that have some really incredible teaching. One of my favorites, the the chorus, these, these are the lyrics. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. But let's not, let us not forget the first verse of this song. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. So instead of looking at anything else, even the sweetest, most beautiful things that we could find in our world, I'm not going to trust in those. I'm going to lean totally and fully on on who Jesus is, what he has done, his work, and that's it. So the question I want to ask you in closing this morning, what have you built your life upon? What have you staked your claim, put your hope in, put your dreams on, put your faith in? And if I'm telling you, as, as a Christian or as someone who doesn't believe in Christ, either one, those foundations you put on that are not of Jesus that are not on himself and on his teaching, will crumble, will fall. But if you put your life upon Jesus, you will stand. And so show it. If you have this faith in Christ, if you believe in him, show it by how you live and how you walk before God. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for who you are. God, I'm so thankful for your word. And God, we also thank you for your enabling grace that doesn't leave us to figure this out on our own, but God gives us the ability to live the transformed life that you've called us to live. God, we are supposed to look at these things that you've said, God, that we almost wish you never said. God, we're supposed to look at these and see them as slightly impossible. But God, through you, anything is possible. So Jesus, we ask that you would radically transform our hearts, God, so that we can live in this way that reflects you, that reflects a totally different lifestyle, a totally different, a totally different way of seeing the world. And so God, this morning, we give ourselves to you. We give our lives to you and we pray this in your name. Amen.